Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about waves. And what we look at with waves, some of the things we'll talk about are the ideas of resonance and looking at how waves can combine. So we can look at the superposition of waves and how they can add together or subtract to give much stronger or much weaker waves. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of this. And first of all, we want to look at oscillations. We've talked a little bit about these before. Uh, we talked more about natural oscillations. These are what we call forced oscillations. And objects can be forced to oscillate by using a driving force that matches a frequency. So we can make something oscillate up and down. For example, a ball on a, a rubber string here, for example, could be forced to oscillate up and down by moving the spring up and moving the uh, moving the hand, the finger up and down. So this is not necessarily how the object wants to oscillate. An, os an object will have a natural frequency. So if there were no forces opposing it, no damping forces, there is a natural frequency at which the object wants to oscillate. So if you did this with an object and you did a frequency that was too low, you wouldn't get the oscillations coming out very large. That is not how this object wants to oscillate. If you're too high, moving your finger too quickly, you will also get a very low displacement. But if you hit it just right, hitting the natural frequency, then you will get very large oscillations. So you're able to drive it at a what we call a resonance. And that is the system being driven at its natural frequency. So when you get this set up, you can then get a very large displacement for less of an input force, less movement of the finger is required. So if you move it too slow or too fast, you will not get a good oscillation. But if you move it just at that natural frequency, you will get a very intense oscillation. And this leads us to the idea of resonance. Now, what do we mean by resonance is that you can constantly increase the amplitude of the wave if you are driving it at its natural frequency. So this is how it wants to oscillate. When you push it to oscillate that same way, you can get a much higher amplitude. And if there is less damping, then you can see that you can go from something very small here, very small oscillations with very heavy damping to a very large amplitude up here when there is very little damping. You are driving something at the frequency at which it wants to move. So you can imagine this with, for example, pushing a child on a swing. There is a certain frequency with which that spring wants to, uh, sorry, which that swing wants to oscillate. So if you push it just right at the right time, you will encourage that and you will in have the amplitude at which the child swings be much higher. If you try to push it at other times or at different rates and you're pushing it at different times, so for example, pushing it at uh, as it's coming the wrong direction, you will actually slow it down. So you will not be able to get as large of an amplitude. So we naturally try to do this when we're pushing someone on a swing, try to get them to go higher and higher. We're trying to push it at its natural frequency. Now we also use in medicine magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, which is a way of being able to resonate the atoms and get the atoms resonating through magnetic fields and able to image that giving us a look inside a human. So we can use that we use things like x rays gives us a view of uh, the more solid portions of our body. But an MRI can allow us to look at softer tissues and to get a view of them without having to cut into someone. So it's a good way to be able to see what is happening and look into someone and to be able to tell how they are, uh, what the problems might be with them. Now, you can also have dangerous examples of this and a famous one is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which we see here as it collapsed. And this was a bridge out in the Tacoma area in Washington State in the United States. And it and underwent a collapse because it ended up getting a wind that just blew it just right to drive the bridge at its natural frequency. So you can imagine that the bridge here of some length 
had some natural frequency associated with. Now normally we have multiple frequencies set in so that you never drive a bridge at exactly at its natural frequency. But in this case the wind just picked it just right and continued to drive it and the oscillations got larger and larger until they became too large for the bridge to be able to handle and it actually collapsed. So large sections of it here you can see that have collapsed. So it can also cause when you get something at a resonance that you don't want at resonance can also cause significant damage such as we see here. So those are a couple of examples with waves, but let's go ahead and define what do we mean by a wave. A wave is a disturbance that propagates away from where it was created. So we have things like water waves or sound waves. We even have light waves that will travel outward from where they are created. You can make your own wave with a piece of string if you tie it down to one end and give it a little pull on one side, shake it up and down a little bit. You can actually drive a wave through that and watch a wave go across and back if you have it set up sufficiently. So here we see the example of the way of a wave coming through uh, in our image here. This is looking at a wave where we have the uh, bird floating on the water. And what you would note is that when the wave moves, the waves are moving to this direction, but the water is just oscillating up and down. So if you watch a bird or a stick or something sitting on top of the water, it will rise and fall with the wave. It does not get pushed along with the wave. It is the wave, dis wave disturbance that actually moves, not the water itself. And we can determine how fast that moves. The velocity of the wave is the speed at which the disturbance moves. Again, it is not the speed at which the water moves. It is only the disturbance. The wave crests are moving across at this speed. And that wave velocity is given by the frequency of, wave of the wave times the wavelength. So if we multiply those two together, we find the frequency, how many waves cross per second. We find the wavelength, what is the distance between two successive crests of the wave. Then we can determine the velocity of that wave. And we can go ahead and look at an example for this. So let's go ahead and look at the velocity of a wave when the distance between them is 10 meters and the time for the seagull to bob up and down is five seconds. So we know everything we need here to be able to calculate the velocity of the wave. And we can do that. We put our numbers up here that we know. Those are the two values that were given. They're already in SI units, so there's no conversions necessary. And we know that the frequency is the first thing we need. The frequency is one over the period. One over five seconds is 0 .0, 0 0.200 seconds, negative seconds to the negative first power. So we have the frequency is 0.2 cycles per second. Now we can also, we know the velocity is now equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So now we've calculated the frequency and we know the wavelength from up above, we just have to put those two in and multiply them together to find out that the velocity of the wave is then two meters per second. So if we know the frequency and the wavelength of any wave, we can calculate the velocity of the wave. So we want to talk a little bit about the different types of waves that we can have. And we look at two types. We look at the transverse and the longitudinal waves. So when we look at these, there we have transverse or shear waves, which occur when the wave is moving in one direction and the disturbance is in the other direction. So in this case, the disturbance is up and down. And that wave propagates to the right. So they are in the opposite directions. They are perpendicular to each other. The wave is moving to the right at some speed and the disturbance is propagating up and down. Now this is different than a longitudinal wave or a compressional wave. We can make that same kind of wave with the same spring we're looking at here. But in this case, the wave is disturbance is propagating to the right and the compression is in the right to left direction. So they are actually parallel to each other. So the disturbance is uh, parallel 
par parallel. So that's the difference between a longitudinal wave we see here on the bottom. This would be a longitudinal wave and the transverse wave up here at the top. Now we can also look at how waves can add together. And this is what we call the superposition of waves, waves adding together. And when they arrive at the same point at the same time, we can add waves together. And we look at two examples here. The amplitudes of these will add together. So the amplitudes of the two disturbances, if we have two overlapping waves, we don't see the waves individual, we see the resultant wave from adding those two or more waves together. So in this case, if we have two waves lined up perfectly peak to peak, then we are going to add those waves together. So if this disturbance has an amplitude of x, and this disturbance has an amplitude of x, then we add those two together, x plus x gives us 2x. So it will be twice the disturbance that we have. This is an example of what we call constructive interference. They are adding together and the waves are reinforcing each other to give a much larger wave than either of the two individual waves. And you could continue this if you had three or four waves adding together, then you could do the same thing again, add multiple waves and get a much, much larger wave. Now the other thing you can do is have destructive interference as we have down here, where we have this value. The amplitude of this wave is x. The amplitude of this wave is negative x. Well, x plus negative x is zero. So the amplitude of this one is nothing. So when you add these two waves that are exactly opposite to each other, you get nothing. There's no wave there. In fact, there's two waves there. There's one that is positive at one point, one that is exactly the same amount negative. So these two are exactly opposite to each other and they completely cancel and you would see no wave. And this is what we see here with, you know, we can get them even more complicated if we add multiple waves together or waves that don't have the same frequencies, same wavelengths. Here we have wave one very a long wavelength, wave two with a very short wavelength. Well, sometimes they add together very well. Sometimes they uh, add together and cancel out completely. You get some points where there would be no wave at all. So here we can get both constructive and destructive interference at the same time. You can get stronger waves or weaker waves. Now a common example of that, especially for the summertime, is the example of a wave pool. So when a wave pool occurs, when you are when you're at a wave pool, I should say, you have examples of waves adding up together or subtracting. So waves are generated up at the front and then added together to uh, have some places where there's very strong waves. You'll get some places where all the waves add together and give you extremely large waves. You get other places where you could walk out here someplace even in the middle of large waves around you and have absolutely no waves because of destructive interference. At that exact point all of the waves are adding together destructively and you can simply stand there or with all the big waves around you and not notice anything simply because everything is adding together just perfectly to subtract away from those. And you can also get the very large waves from constructive interference. When all the waves are adding together, you get a much, much larger wave than those that are being produced at the front. Now, another example of it that I don't mention here would be noise canceling headphones. How do we get he headphones that cancel the noise? Well, they take and re adjust the noise that is detected and invert it. So a very loud noise can be combined with a very loud noise where everything has been inverted, positive becoming negative, negative becoming positive. And if you blast those two sounds into your ear, they completely cancel. So, well, as you know, if you use noise canceling headphones, it's not perfect, uh, but ideally they would cancel, but they do dull down the noise by putting a negative value in and causing destructive interference. So that's another example of destructive interference that we can see.
So let's go ahead and finish up talking about waves with our summary. And some of the things we talked about were the idea of a natural frequency. And that is the frequency at which the system wants to oscillate. That is where it wants to be if there were no external forces. If you don't push it at some other frequency, this is where it wants to. When you get something oscillating at its natural frequency, when you push it there, you can push it into resonance, which can cause things like the Tacoma Narrows uh, bridge that collapsed. We also talked about wave. What is a wave? Define it. It is a disturbance that propagates away from the location at which it was created. So we can watch water waves, sound waves. They all propagate away from where they are actually created. And waves of any kind will superimpose on each other. This We talked about it in terms of water waves and sound waves, but it applies to any type of wave. They can cancel each other out if they're opposite or they can reinforce each other if they both come in to the same sign if they're both positive or both negative they can reinforce each other and make much larger waves than you would otherwise expect. So that concludes this lecture on waves. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then have a great day everyone and I will see you in class.